What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grindline Podcast. This is to episode 270. I'm your host, Greg. I'm here tonight with Tyler. Ryan has school stuff to do because of a stupid situation where in the United States you're required to have degrees for stuff that you're already doing, uh, which is really, really dumb. But Tyler, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Uh, better than the Red Wings, I will say. Um, glad that the NCAA regionals were as good as they were. Some of those games are fantastic. Baseball's back, which is awesome. Uh, and the Red Wings continue to flounder in mediocrity and, and actually, in some cases, really bad hockey. So um, that's where we're at right now. Yeah, right now they're trying to decide if it was a good goal in this lightning game or not. Hopefully they can win this game because if they don't win this game, I really don't see the playoffs as, as a possibility. Um, obviously, they're two points out, so they're still in it. But it doesn't feel like they're in it. I'll tell you that right now. It really doesn't. Well, the best case scenario for tonight would be, and again, you'll be listening to this by the time this happens, would be the Red Wings win this game and the Islanders beat the Flyers because I think the team you're chasing right now is the Flyers. They continue to do terrible on most nights and the Washington Capitals keep doing better. So the Caps will probably lock up that third spot. The Flyers can drop down. The Islanders will probably stay in line with us. But if we win tonight and the Islanders win, we will be tied in points in the standings. So let's start with standings. We will be tied with the Philadelphia Flyers at 82 points. We have a game in hand on the Flyers. So that would put us ahead of them. We would have one more uh, win, one more regulation or overtime win. Row is what they use for the tiebreaker. So we would bump back up into a spot and that would make us. The Tampa Bay Lightning have 89 points, so we'd be far behind them for the first wild card spot. But it'll be interesting to see, I guess, how the season goes with us, the Capitals, the Flyers, and the Islanders kind of racing there. Oh, and of course, they come back down and actually score a goal. The Devils will be another team that you're going to have to look at at 76 points that could also be in the conversation. So again, it's going to be tight down to the end uh, with this race. The Red Wings do have a tough schedule coming up. And so do really the teams around us. Probably the easiest schedule right now is going to be the Philadelphia Flyers, but they're not playing great hockey. Yeah, and we saw how that went for the Red Wings uh, when when the schedule was supposed to get easier. So maybe with these tougher games, the Wings will play well as as Anthony Sorelli scores on that that goal to tie the game up now. As, and we're talking about the live game going on between the Wings and the Tampa Bay Lightning. But it just doesn't feel like they're a playoff team. I don't know if you blame the coaching staff. I don't know if you blame Eisenman for not doing anything at the trade deadline. I don't know if it's a combination of everything, but I'll just say one thing, like something happened to this team. And I I, like, I'm sorry. The excuse of Dylan Larkin coming out of the lineup is just not a good enough excuse to me. Well, I agree to a point. So Dylan Larkin, very important part of the team. He's the heart and soul of the team. He's the motivator. He's the captain. But they're playing an important stretch of hockey right now. And when you play an important stretch of hockey poorly, what else does it come down to besides players? It comes down to coaching. And again, we have hesitated a long time in in saying this is a big coaching problem. But the more they lose and the more this happens to them and the more they come out and they just get outshot by 20 on some nights, it's just, it's got to be a coaching problem. Now, has Newsy lost the room completely? Are the guys, is there infighting in the room? Do they, are they having a players only meeting where they need to get in and just peel paint? And there's some, there's some kind of news in air quotes that something like that may have happened recently. But it's just, at what point do you say this is a, a roster mismanagement issue? And the coaches need to do something to fix it. Fix the scheme. Stop dumping. Fix uh, playing defensemen who are terrible for uh, 20 minutes during a game in which they're obviously the cause of several goals. And I think right now what it is is it's the inability to adapt in a in a really important part of the season where you have to win games. And like we said, you're in this tight race with three other teams that they just seem to just continue to do the same thing and just expect that that same thing to produce better results when it's clearly not. 
Yeah, it seems like it's the same shit all over and over again. And, you know, like, at one point or another, like, if 20 players or 18 skaters are making the same mistakes night in and night out, like, yeah, on one hand, it is on the players, but on the other hand, it's on the coaching staff. And I'm sorry, at this point, if they miss the playoffs, everything's on the table, in my opinion. I'm not saying that Newsy should be fired. I'm I'm really not saying that. But would I be absolutely floored and shocked if it happened? No, I wouldn't. Because Steve Eisenman wants this team to become a, not just a playoff team, but at some point make that rise from a playoff team to a Stanley Cup contender. Now, obviously, this has been a better season than last year. But this taste in your mouth you look i'm just looking at espn's website right now with with the with the schedule and you know you had that huge losing streak you had a really bad month of december right and it just seems like when things go wrong they go really wrong and it's hard for them to get back on the right track now they had a bad december and then they had a really good what was it february that they played really well yeah they had the seven game win streak so i mean on one hand, you say, okay, it's on the coaching staff, but it's also, I think it's a mixture of things. I really do. I think that this this group, for some reason, just doesn't mix well. And then the coaching staff at the same time, I don't think mixes well with the team that you have. I think that this team, I'm not saying that, that Newsy needs to be fired. Maybe it's it's just like the assistant coaches need to be let go and they need to start from scratch with assistant coaches. But, um, you know, they have done a little bit of that. I'm starting to see a little bit more of Blashill and Lalone than I thought at first. Um, you know, empowering guys like Jeff Petrie and Ben Sherratt. Like, I just don't see the point in that. Like, give Edvinson some more time out there. Give Cider. I mean, obviously, Cider's playing a lot. Give Wallman some more time out there. I just don't see the point in giving guys like Petrie and Sherratt, like, the load of 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 ice time it just doesn't make sense to me it really just doesn't i feel like newsy has the reverse jeff blash problem so blash would panic and he would just line blender to hell it seems like newsy is open to kind of mixing up the forward lines a little bit but he almost absolutely refuses to touch veteran defensemen so we've seen we saw Wallman got, uh, get benched for a few games because of poor play. Uh, we've seen uh, I think Ghost Ghost is benched a few games for poor play, but you don't bench Jeff Petrie for having just consecutive, absolutely terrible games. And I I'm done hearing the excuse that it's well he's the only right defenseman you have and you can't bench him. I think a guy on his offside would still be better than what Jeff Petrie is doing right now. They, well, people are like, well, the zone entry and the setup in the offensive zone. It's like, if you can't get in the offensive zone to set up, what good is that argument? If you get in there and he flubs the puck and gives it away, what good is that argument? I just, the game against Carolina really pissed me off. So the, the Red Wings lost to the Hurricanes 0-4. to four. That was a game where my TV cut out be, and because Comcast was apparently also done with the Red Wings. But Jeff Petrie was a minus three, yet he got the most time of any defenseman at 18 minutes and 42 seconds. Mo was next at 18.15. And that's just, Mo had a great game, and he's been playing well with Ben Sherratt. But you continue to put Petrie out there hoping that his mistakes will just stop happening, and people will point to, oh, well, he's got great 5v5 time and all this. But it's like, when you look at the goals that do happen, it's you got to go with the eye test too. Sure, he might be good in in parts of the game that really might not matter much, but where it matters and when they have a high danger shot, Jeff Petrie is nowhere to be found. That's the problem. That's where you have to look at stats versus eye test because he might mediocrely pass some of the stat test, but Jeff Petrie on an almost nightly basis absolutely fails the eye test because it's, it looks like recently every goal that goes in is almost a direct fault of his. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And and to, to your point about that Carolina game, there was so many other sporting events and, and things going on in that game where I did have the wings game on 
And at one point, I'm just like, you know what? I'm I'm not doing this anymore. There's baseball on. There's March Madness. There's the NCAA hockey tournament. So I I, I flip to that stuff. I usually am not one to turn games off. I'll put it on another screen or I'll put it on my phone or something. I usually don't turn it off. That game pissed me off. That game really pissed me off. And I'm like, you know what? I'm I'm just not going to do it. Petrie is just not. So, look, I'm not one to say, look, the guy, is, is he a good guy? Sure, he's a good guy, it seems like, right? But you have to call a spade a spade at one point or another. And he's just not the defenseman he used to be, which to make sense what is he 35 years old 36 years old yeah he's getting up there i'm sorry i don't care that dan petrie's his dad i don't care that he's from ann arbor i don't care that he play that he's from the area like it's not that big of a deal at some point or another you have to send a message to this team and say you know what jeff petrie you could go upstairs on the seventh floor and take a seat and we're gonna let guys like edvinson play we're gonna bring up a guy like johansson and let him play we're gonna empower a guy like jake wallman if he's playing well like you need to start doing these kind of things otherwise you're going to start questioning the coaching staff if you already haven't at this point and i would like i said i'm not calling for Derek alone's head i think he's a good guy i think he's a pretty good hockey coach in my opinion but when you don't adjust on losing streaks and you just kind of let things snowball and snowball and snowball and it takes forever to get out of it it's fair to start questioning it. I'm sorry. I know this is what year two, but this is the end of year two. And it's so far. I mean, yeah, they started out pretty good. They had that really bad month and then they, they had a really good February and then March really sucked. So when the going got tough, it got worse. So at some point or another, you have to call it a spade and spade and say, you know what, maybe we do take a look at the coaching staff and see, at the very least, do we need to make some adjustments to the scheme? Do we need to make adjustments to what we're trying to execute and how we're trying to execute it? Or do we need to make the coaching staff change altogether, meaning the assistants and the head coach? I just think that, like you said, we had a bad march in teams that are playoff teams that really want it that are ready to get in there and the coaching staff really is ready to get them ready for it they don't have bad entire months they figure out how to turn things around they win a couple games in there they don't go on seven game losing streaks they win a few games unless you're the oilers and then you have mcdavid and then you turn it around and you win a million games in a row but that's not it they don't have the the high and superstars in order to just say we're done we're taking over we're doing that's got to be a whole team effort and i think that relies even more on coaching when you don't have guys that can do that uh but back to the jeff petrie thing we it could we had said for a while we're like well you gotta kind of play him because jake wallman's out and that as soon as wallman's back you should be able to scratch petrie and like i said just move someone over move Sherrod over move olimata over but today, on April Fool's Day, nonetheless, Lalone said at his press conference, and we're watching it right now, Wallman was in, but instead of getting rid of Jeff Petrie or, like, sitting him, they put in, or they scratch Olimata. Olimata is a healthy scratch. Now, has Olimata been great? No. But he has not been as bad as Jeff Petrie. And it's just rinse and repeat the same stuff over and over again. And it's, at this point in the season, it's really tiring because, I, I could see it if it was early and he's like, man, maybe it's a bad stretch for him. Maybe we need to give him a few more games to see if this is really what he is for the, the season and then make some decisions. It's not like you've got eight games left. It's this is not a time to be figuring out if we can do more stuff with Jeff Petrie. It's time to cut it in the off season. You can buy him out. It's fine. But I just it's to keep forcing him in there and keep giving him big minutes and putting him in high pressure situations for him to consistently fail. That is an, that's an abject failure on the coaching staff. There's no other way to put it because they're the only ones that make those decisions. And again, I'm not calling for Malone's head. I'm not one to just make rational decisions like that or, or irrational decisions and say, no, this guy should be fucking fired because, you know, we've seen a couple bad months and, you know, you can't have that in the NHL. But in a situation and 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 a NHL that we live in where coaches are fired all the time, would I be shocked if he's the head, not the head coach next year? No, I wouldn't. Uh, 
with Steve Eisenman and knowing what Steve Eisenman typically does, I guess I would be a little shocked. But in this day and age of the NHL, I I would not be surprised if he's not your head coach next year. Or at least there's not some change at some level on the coaching staff. So we're going to do real quick. We're going to talk a little bit more about that after the break. Uh, first, I want to remind everyone that we are doing a Lucas Raymond jersey giveaway. Head over to our Twitter channel. It ends on Wednesday. Wednesday night, a winner will be chosen and announced. But you can head over. All you got to do is sub to us on YouTube, like and retweet and tag a couple friends, and you will be entered to uh, possibly win a Lucas Raymond jersey. But we'll be right back after a word from DraftKings. We know hockey games move fast, but with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you can score faster than anything happening on the ice. This week, new customers can bet 5 bucks and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. And right now, we might be taking the Red Wings to lock up that second wild card position in the East. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app with code THPN. New customers bet just 5 bucks on the NHL and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code THPN, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-878-9777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2024. All rights reserved. And we're back. And Tyler would like to say one thing apparently about the playoffs before we go on to our next subject. So Tyler, go ahead. If you're going to make the playoffs, obviously these next, what, nine games are important. But if you're going to look at ones to circle... That one against Washington at home is a must-have. That one at Pittsburgh is a must-have, and you need both of the Montreal games. So, there's that. Yeah, pick up the Leafs game as a bonus. The Leafs game is possible, too, because I think at this point they've already clinched the playoffs. So, And they're pretty much already locked into playing Boston in the first round. So, um, I don't know. And the Buffalo one is another one that you need to have, too. And there's, there's a couple of, of must have wins in there including this tampa bay one by the way so we'll see how it goes they need at least a point in this game really you need to win this game but if, i'll take a point if you can get that then you need the islanders to lose to to philadelphia tonight no we want the islanders to win Sorry, the other way around i said that wrong so we're gonna talk about now detroit hockey now put out an article bob duff bob duff has been covering the red wings for a very long time uh, so he is one of the more what I would consider trusted sources. He just put this article out at a really bad time. Now, again, it is April Fool's Day, but it, nowhere in this article does it make it sound like it's a joke. Normally, if it's an April Fool's joke, it'll be a little jokey or it'll say April Fool's at the end. And nowhere does it do this. So the title of the article is Could Cup Winner Be the Next Coach of the Red Wings? And it says an NHL source is telling hockey now that the possibility of a coaching change is something that is being pondered by Detroit Red Wings GM Steve Eiserman. According to the source, Eiserman might be considering a change in his coach in the offseason where the Red Wings to continue their free fall out of Stanley Cup playoff position. And if that is indeed the route he decides to take, the man at the top of the list of desirable candidates on Eiserman's short list would be former St. Louis Blues coach Craig Berube. He goes on to say another NHL source was telling Hockey Now that on Friday, Iserman read the riot act to his coaching staff and players regarding their lackluster performance of late. They followed that up by blowing a third period lead in a 3-2 shootout loss at Florida, currently 0-2-2 on a season-high five-game road trip. Detroit completes the journey tonight in Tampa. And that is just... He wrote this before today. He posted it today, but he wrote it before today. And that's how I know it's not an April Fool's joke because it says, it really says Detroit completes their journey Monday at Tampa. So he must have written it Saturday or something and then posted it or written it Sunday and posted it today. I just, again, would, you said, would it surprise you to see a coaching change? No, wouldn't surprise me to see a coaching change. Iserman has fired coaches early into their tenure before. To get someone like Berube would be a huge win. I mean, a massive one. I was shocked when the Blues fired Craig Berube. And I think that's the kind of guy you need. He's not a hard ass like Tortorella. 
but I think he's a motivator. I think he's a guy that will go into the room and get fired up if he needs to get fired up. But I also think he's got the side to him where he works with the players to improve themselves. So I think Barube would be a great hire. Yeah, I think he's one of the better coaches in the league. Um, I, I, I was shocked when the Blues fired him because the Blues just don't have the roster um, to compete. You know, they, they don't have their Petrangelo. They don't have Tarasenko. They don't have, um, you know, a, a team worthy, uh, Ryan O'Reilly. They don't, they don't have the team they won the Stanley Cup with, Ivan Barbashev, like those guys, um, to to compete at this level as the Wings almost score. Did they? No, no, it's not in. Um, but th- they didn't have the, the players to compete at, at the NHL level and to make the playoffs. And, and that Blues roster, you can kind of t- see that they're, they're kind of in transition. where. If he were to come to Detroit and be the head coach, the new head coach of the Red Wings, um, I mean, that's a huge win. That's, that's like when Toronto got Mike Babcock, not not as the coach, but as the pedigree, um, as, as a good head coach. And now we've obviously found out what Mike Babcock was all about. But my point is, that at the time, the Leafs are like, wow, this is a win for us. Uh, and I think most people in the NHL thought that as well. Same thing with Bruce Cassidy going to the Vegas Golden Knights. You know, that was a huge win for the Golden Knights. You know, something like that. So that would be interesting. I mean, I'm not sure that – I don't see if if there's any – is there any lineage between those two? Like, is there any do, – do they have a connection other than the fact that they played in the NHL at the same time? I wonder I wonder if Barube and Eisenman had some sort of past, whether it was in a front office or, or um, you know, at, at some level. But regardless of the situation, if there is a connection and if Bob Duff is saying this, I don't think it's a lie. I don't think it's an April Fool's joke, and I think it's something that should be taken seriously and certainly a possibility if the Wings do move on from Newsy. So there is kind of in between. There's some chatter, I guess. It's just kind of pondering. It says it's worth noting that Iserman's closest, one of closest friends in the game is Blues GM Doug Armstrong. If Eiserman decides to get in-depth intel on Barube, he's certainly got access to the best source of information, as well as current Red Wings players Billy Huso, Jake Wallman, David Perron, and Robbie Fabry all played for Barube in St. Louis. So if he needs questions answered, he's got the guys there to answer the questions. In his career as a coach, he has coached 543 games, and his record is 281, 190, and 72. So an overall winning record. And I think it's just a guy, we had said forever that the coaching carousel sucks. And I I still will hold the position that the coaching carousel sucks. But at this point, it might be something that the Red Wings need to at least get them to that point. A coach who's done it before as a head coach, who has coached his team that doesn't have superstars into the playoffs and to a Stanley Cup, that might be something that, that you need for this team because we, even before the season, we did the roster, like the war roster project projections and they projected out higher. Now, were they doing that? They were doing that. And like you said, they had two bad months, but I feel like a different coach, a more experienced coach may be able to pull a team out of a rut like that quicker and move them forward rather than, again, I don't think someone like Brube would just force Jeff Petrie out there night after night thinking he's going to go back and revert to his Pittsburgh days or his Montreal days. No. And, and the thing is about Barube, I think, you know, you kind of alluded to it already, but that, okay. So they did have Tarasenko and they did have Ryan O'Reilly and they did have, you know, um, Alex Petrangelo, but like they didn't have like a Sidney Crosby or an Alex Ovechkin or like a, uh, you know, they did have some pretty good young players like Cairo and Robert Thomas, but like, and that was like in their first and second years, I believe. So like, yeah, they had some good players, but they didn't, that, that Boston team was more talented than that St. Louis team was in 2019 in the Stanley Cup final. And, you know, the Blues just outworked them and they scored timely goals and they had good goaltending by Bennington and their, their, their um, system was good. Um, So like, it it kind of, I can see the fit. I can, like, you know, sometimes people say stuff 
and there's absolutely no no like rhyme or reason why they say it and it kind of just doesn't make sense like the Patrick Kane thing to me never really made sense but you it, it kind of came to fruition and now it does make a little sense right this one makes a lot of sense the, the, there's sometimes where where think people say things and it makes absolutely no sense and you can't see it i can see this do i think it'll happen i don't know i don't know your guess is as good as mine but i will say one thing about it if berube comes here and you don't make the playoffs with this roster i'm sure there'll be some tinkering with the roster uh there typically is every year uh, especially with the salary cap going up, you know, at that point you would have to start looking at the, the team itself and the nucleus and, and you know, the Mo Siders and the Dylan Larkins and the guys like that who are leaders on this team. However, I mean, it, it'll just be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I think that he is certainly the kind of coach that could come here and, and have immediate success. Um, but I also think New Zealand can still have some some success here. And if they make the playoffs, then this is probably a non-conversation. So if we want to talk about one that doesn't make sense, and this just riled the base all up, and as soon as there's a name, so there's a couple names that people are throwing out there that I absolutely hate. Uh, Gerard Gallant, absolutely no way. No. You want to see what happened with ruining prospects uh, that Gerard Gallant does? Go look at the Rangers. Look at how long it took Alexi Lafreniere to turn around. Look at the development of Capo Caco. The dude hates. Jeff Petrie would get 25 minutes a night under Gerard Gallant. And there's a reason that two teams that are very good teams fired him in the midst of being very good. He's just, he wears out his welcome way too fast. Is not good with prospects. If one more person mentions Joel Quenville again, like absolute not. Joel Quenville should never be allowed to show his face in the NHL ever again for what happened in Chicago. Never again should he be allowed to do that. To put Winning, the team is winning. Let's not mess with the team because they're winning to cover up sexual assault. That's not a thing you do, which is the reason that he needs approval from Gary Bettman to get an NHL job again, which I don't think he'll ever get. But another one, Sergei Fedorov will not return as the CSKA head coach next season. Sergei Fedorov did win two Gagarin Cups in three seasons, and he is announced that he's not coming back, which made Red Wings Twitter go absolutely insane. My take on it is that the Illiches, I don't think would ever let it happen. But the other side of it is, yeah, he won two cups in Russia. Uh, the NHL and KHL are not the same. They're not the same kind of league. The other half of it is he was coaching Putin's like favorite team. And more likely than not, that team is going to do well or else you go to the gulag. And Sergey did not. I think it was this season he did. I don't believe they made the playoffs. So unless he's like in fear of his life and needs to like defect Russia because his team didn't make the playoffs. I just I'm not sure that it would translate into an NHL head coaching job. Now, maybe you bring him in as a player development kind of person or maybe try and find a assistant coaching job for him or something. I just don't think with his number not retired, like the Illich is refusing to retire his number. I know he's played in alumni games. I know he's come back for events and stuff. I don't think there's any way they let him behind that bench. I just think that the the grudge runs that deep that they don't want him to have any official capacity on this team. So I think time heals a lot of things. The fact that he was there for the, what was it? The 2014 alumni game at Comerica park and, and against, what was that against the Toronto Maple Leaf alumni? And he was at the winter classic and stuff like that. Um, You know, I think he played in the alumni game in 2016 against the avalanche too, if I remember correctly. Anyways, I, I think time heals things, and I think there's a possibility. How strong of a possibility? Probably not not a lot, maybe 10%, maybe. Um, I also think that the, the Fedorov thing is, like, the, it's the one thing in this fan base that people feel strongly one way with or strongly the other way with. There's not a whole lot of people that are indifferent about it. The older people are definitely pissed off. Um, 
either they, they go one way, either that he should be in, he's a Hall of Famer, he should be, his number should be retired, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And then there's some older people that are like, no, fuck that. He he went to the Anaheim Ducks, a team that was basically a rival of the Wings. And, and then he went to Ohio. Yeah, and then he went to the Columbus Blue Jackets. So my thing is weird because now we're going to have a conversation about the number retired. I personally think the number should be retired. But then again, I was oh, I agree. I wasn't old enough at the time. I mean, obviously, I remember watching Fedorov. I remember him watch, wa- watching him score goals and, and being a part of the Red Wings. But in terms of, like, him going to Anaheim, like, I mean, I was a little kid. Like, oh, Sergei Fedorov was, was on the Red Wings, and now he's on the Ducks. Like, that happens in sports. I didn't know that there was, like, a tiff between Illich and, and Fedorov and, and all that. So, But the thing is with that, does Chris Illich care about that? Because if he doesn't care about that, then then we have a conversation. If he well, feels like Mr. Tyler, I did. Marion Illich is still in the picture, too. Yeah, exactly. So I guess there's part that's part of it as well. But if Chris Illich and, and Sergey have a little bit of a relationship, can he smooth it over? And if there's one guy in this entire city, in this entire state, other than maybe Jim Harbaugh, that that brings a fan base together it's steve eisenman if steve eisenman is endorsing sergey as a player development or an assistant coach or hell maybe a head coach um i the illiches will at least listen to him because steve eisenman is hockey town's yeah you know number one son and and if steve eisenman wants something and that's a possibility then they'll at least explore it well, then the fear becomes if he wants it and they say no, then that means Iserman doesn't have control of this team. And Iserman has said before that Chris has told him that it's he has the the will to do what he needs to do to win with this team. And if that's true, and Iserman does want Fedorov in the organization, then that would tell me Chris won't tell him no. So that's the other side of it. But again, I'm just not sure that that coaching experience, because it's a name, people are going to jump all over it. It being a name doesn't mean he will be a good NHL coach. That's, that's, I think, what we have to boil it down to is, would it be cool to see the band get back together? Yeah, probably. But I wouldn't jump right into now lead this team to victory, even though it's going to be a team full of rookies who are developing people with not a lot of NHL experience a team right now who's falling in the standings out of a playoff position and is going to have a really rough off season uh, unless Iserman does some pretty big work. I just don't see bringing in a guy with no NHL. Take the name off of it. Take the name Sergei Fedorov, name him Michael Smith. With his career in the KHL, if his name was Michael Smith and he didn't have Sergei Fedorov's face, would you immediately say make him the Red Wings coach? No, you wouldn't. So I I think it's a lot of take the nostalgia out of it and take the name off of it. And I think your answer becomes something completely different. I think a lot of times when you have a former head coach or a former player in your organization that becomes the head coach of your team, a lot of the times you become disappointed. In certain situations, the Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, he, he brought Michigan a national title, right? But Alan Trammell coached the Detroit Tigers to one of the worst records in all of Major League Baseball history. And Alan Trammell is one of the one of the most decorated Detroit Tigers players of all time. As his number retired, is in the Hall of Fame. All that. So you have to see both sides of it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you want Sergei Fedorov. In some cases, some people want Sergei Fedorov to be the head coach of the Red Wings. And how cool would that be if Eisenman's the general manager? And Fedorov is is the Stanley Cup champion head coach. And then sure, they win a awesome. cup. How cool would that be? And then it would be cool. And Sergey are on the ice again, hosting the cup, hoisting the cup. It would be cool. But I'll just I'll just make the quick comparison to Patrick Waugh, you know, coaching the Avalanche and Joe Sackick being the general manager. Those teams are not very good under Patrick Waugh. Now we can debate whether Patrick Waugh is a good head coach in the NHL. 
We can debate whether you like Patrick Waugh or not, because I know most people that are listening to this do not, and myself included. But the comparison to that would be like, okay, you know, Sergey uh, is now the head coach of the Red Wings, and they go three seasons, and he leaves right before. Now, one thing I do want to say, everyone talks about Sergey as, as the new head coach of the Red Wings. I think that if you are going down the route of, like, next head coach of the Red Wings in terms of, like, former players, Igor Larionov is at the top of my list. And I think just because of how smart he is, I mean, he doesn't have a whole lot of experience, but he's coached Russia at the World Juniors, I believe. He's coached in the KHL, and I think he's still coaching in the KHL. So that, to me, is the guy that I would look at if if you're looking at former players. I think that Craig Berube, obviously, is the more decorated person and the person that I would I would look at if if you're going to bring in somebody to to replace the loan. Yeah, I think that and, and people had mentioned that too. I think Larianoff would be a happy middle, but then again, it's a guy who has not coached in the NHL. And any guy who has not coached in the NHL is not going generally nine times out of ten is not going to come here and just be an instant hit. And I think for a team that is going to be young, if it was a team that was like in playoffs already and then like they then just had a weird stumble, but they know how to get there and they know what it takes to get in, then maybe try a guy like that or a team that is absolutely tear down. Like it would have been hiring Sergey instead of hiring Lalone before last season. I think that they're too far into it now to make a move like that because you've got a little bit of, you've got some established younger players like Cider and Raymond, which are going to be bringing more guys in. So I, I think as I'm going, I'm talking to myself back and forth about it because you are going to be bringing in a lot of new guys. So it's like, do you want to bring in a coach because you haven't made the playoffs yet and you might not this season? Do you want to bring in a coach to try and do that next season? Or do you want to stick with what you've had, even though he also hasn't proven he can make it to the playoffs and keep going? But I think the better decision is to go out if you are replacing the coach to go out and get a coach that already has quite a bit of coaching experience and knows what it takes to kind of get those guys to the next level. But we're going to cut it short tonight. Tyler, I want to get your final thoughts before we sign off. And that's just any parting words you got. I just have a quick question for you. And, and I guess oh, it's no. not really a question, but it's something that kind of just, I'm, I'm watching the wings game tonight and they keep showing uh, the development um, of, of, of Cas- Marco Casper and, and some of the players in GR. And Dan Cleary has a lot to do with that. Is Dan Cleary, could you see him behind the bench in Detroit? Not saying no. that it would happen tonight or no. tomorrow, but. No, I think Dan, I think Dan, for as much shit as people give him, I think he's just a really good player development guy. I think he's got a really yeah. good eye for talent. I think he knows what each, I, he, it seems like he takes a very personal approach to each prospect getting to know them, getting to know what they need to develop, getting them the people and, and things they need to do that development. And then like, like he says, sending Nate Danielson back to the back to juniors with kind of like that, that assignment work to get himself to the next level. So I think that that, I think that he's good in the position that he's in, in player development. I think that Sean Horkoff, same thing, good in the player development position. I'm going to stick with you need a guy who has a lot of that coaching experience to kind of bump them up to the next level if you want to make that move. Yeah, final thoughts are um, Barube would be a perfect candidate if they do move on. Um, But like I said, these games are important. You're including this Tampa game that obviously hasn't gone final yet. Um, It's what, one-to-one still going to the third period? So One-to-one going into crunch time. Go win a period and you win a hockey game and you get get yourself that much closer to the goal and making the Stanley Cup playoffs for the first time since, what, 20, 2016? So that would be interesting. Um, and like I said, you know, this team is teetering and circling the drain, whatever um, analogy you want to use, but they're still in it. The reality is they're still in it. And this is where you wanted them to be. They just didn't get to the place you wanted to be um in the right way i guess but i mean there there are going to be bumps and and bruises as the season goes on and i mean that's kind of what's happened you've had one month you've had another month that isn't great and um 
this is where you are. So if you would have told us at this time in, in October that the Wings, they're going to be two points out with seven games remaining or what? How what was it? Nine games remaining? Eight games remaining. Eight games remaining, seven after tonight. And you're right in it. I think we would have taken it. I think we would have taken it and ran with it. So. I think it's just the the way they've gotten here that's kind of topsy turvy. But if they get in, and they play a playoff game at LCA, we'll all just shut up about w- what happened during the season, and we'll move forward next year with with some good prospects and maybe some additions to the roster, and we'll go from there. But we'll see what happens. You can follow me on Twitter at Seal Dog ninety one. Yeah, my final thoughts just gonna be promotional stuff. Come join us out on uh, this coming Friday at uh, Vintage Detroit in Plymouth. For their op- Tigers opening day weekend kind of festivities, they're going to have food trucks, they're going to have prizes, or they might it might be catering and prizes, but there will be food, there will be prizes, and there will be me and Ryan there on Friday. So we'll you can come hang out with us, get some t-shirts, our t-shirts will be there for sale too, and it'll be a good time. Also, again, t-shirts, Vintage Detroit, go to their website, there is like a locals section, you can also find it in our Twitter, uh, that you can go check out our exclusive t-shirt collection with Vintage Detroit. We also like to give a shout out to the Hockey Podcast Network and thank them for hosting us and spreading our podcast around. You can go sub to us on YouTube and turn on the notifications. You'll get notified whenever an episode goes live. Um, But that's going to do it for us tonight. So for Tyler, I am Greg. You stay classy, Hockey Town.